Okay, we're getting started. Um, so there, uh, the aquaculture section is next. And uh, this is uh, on seafood's potential to ensure our future food security. Our speakers are, um, will be Dr. Scott Nichols. He's founder and principal for Foods Future, why aquaculture is important. Dr. Kareem Karmali, CEO of Vera Maris. Uh, in place of uh, Dr. Steve Hart, we will have Ms. Devin Meserve. She's the marketing manager for Global Aquaculture Alliance. And then uh, Dr. Jessica Gephardt, she's a fellow at CISINC, and um, that'll be the order that we'll be presenting. Um, we did have uh, one question for the brain health panel, uh, but the scientist to answer that is not in the room. So uh, we will. Um, this afternoon we will have breakout sessions, and so on the, um, there'll be a, brain health discussion, um, aquaculture, and also consumer education and outreach. So I'd like to welcome up Dr. Scott Nichols uh, to present and kick us off on the aquaculture session. So with what you heard this morning from those who were talking to you about brain health, the first half of my talk is taken care of. So they didn't deliver a spoiler alert, but here we go. I'd like to talk about why we might want fish from a farm and why, in particular, um, that plays into our availability of fish and as we think about meeting our daily, um, our, the, from the daily guidelines. So a question I think that we need to face is where will our food come from? We face an easy food future if we get our food from the same places that we're pretty much getting it now. And then there's a little bit of English on the ball if we have to get it from somewhere else in the future. And this is a particularly relevant question when you think about some of what's happening in the world. By 2038, the population on the planet is going to be about 9 billion people. And by 2050, the estimate is that it'll be 9.8 billion people. So we have a tremendous increase in population that's about to land right on our laps. But on top of that, there's a change in the demographics of us all as well. So the CIA in the United States every year does an analysis of economic growth rates throughout the world. And what they found for 2016, for instance, was that 47 countries have real GDP growth of greater than 5%. And there are countries like South Sudan that you would expect new emerging economies that are growing rapidly, but also included in this list is India, China, and Bangladesh. So there's some very large populations in here as well. Net of all of this is that there are currently about 1.9 billion people on the earth in what one would call a middle class, and broadly defined. By 2050, that's going to be 3.9 billion people. And with a change in wealth, comes a change in what people want to see on the dinner table. And so when you put the changing demographics and the changing population together, the World Wildlife Fund says that we will need to, roughly need to double our food production by the early 2040s. And the FAO says it's 1.7 fold. There are reasonable quibbles between these two numbers are beyond the purview of what we want to do today. So let's just back off and say it's enormous, and that suffices. When we think about our current agriculture, 38% of the world's land is used to produce the food that we eat right now, and we use 70% of the world's water. So we can't double either of those. So the one thing we know about our pathway to a hopeful food future the only thing we know about our pathway to a hopeful food future is it's not the one we're currently on. And there are two billion people coming to dinner and we got no idea what we're going to serve them. So this is no big spoiler. You're, you are at the Seafood Nutrition Partnership. Let's feed everybody fish. And when we think about fish, well, we have an organization, again, the uh, FAO, that biannually looks at uh, something that they call the state of the world's fisheries and aquaculture. And in doing this, what they do is they assess the status of fisheries. And they have three categories. They have one that says underexploited, 
another one that's fully exploited, and another that's over-exploited. And starting in 2008, 80% of fisheries had, were either at or above their sustainable limits. And we didn't take this in any kind of good direction, and the report that came out in April this year has us at 93%. So, very simply, we're not going to get more fish from wild capture. It's a very simple thing. Mr. Klein told us this in seventh grade algebra. Look at the equation and reason it through before you try to solve it. The numerator is the same. The denominator is getting bigger. We're hosed. So we can't have more fish from the wild. We can have what we already have, but we can't have more. And we can't address all the things that Joe talked to us about today that are so important. So that brings us to farming. And there are some legitimate questions. What can farming do for us? A real interesting study was done recently by Hallie Freilich and her colleagues at UC San Diego. And what they did was to set, develop a set of criteria for how they viewed the oceans to decide where in the oceans do we have reasonable candidates for high intensity aquaculture. So they looked at a variety of things. Their, their intent in doing this was to be very strict in what they included. So they included political considerations, current shipping lanes, marine protected areas. The water couldn't be more than 200 meters deep so it could accommodate the current gear that we have. And what they came up with is that 3% of the ocean's surface would be suitable for high intensity aquaculture. And to put that in perspective, what they said was that if you were to farm 0.015% of the ocean surface, that would give you um, an equivalent to the current wild capture that we receive. It's in rough numbers, 90 million tons of fish a year. So if we twiddle with that just a little bit and you say, well, if we were to have 0.09% of the oceans in high intensity aquacultural production in 2038, what that would mean is that there would be 60 kilograms per person per year of seafood available to the 9 billion people on the planet. That's, a, that's a, a, an extraordinary way to sort of flip onto this question. Do we get more fish? Well, yes, we do get more fish if we do that. And we can begin to meet um, some of the things that Joe said, and we can meet what Tom said earlier. If you recall, he showed us what we're getting out of the dietary guidelines and what the di dietary guidelines are. And so he had to shrink things on the slide because the difference is so big. Uh, that it boggles your mind, but we're not getting anywhere near that. And we can if we can do something like this. And so when we think about this, we have to, we have to do this in a particular way. So if you sort of think about what happened in the Green Revolution, we got an extraordinary amplification of our food supply. And you kind of peek that up and you look at the other side, and we did it at the expense of a fair amount of environmental degradation. So we who wish to see aquaculture expand wish also to see it expand without the same sort of environmental degradation that happened in the Green Revolution. So what we need to do is we need to raise our fish with fewer inputs, lower impacts. And that will be the subject of part of what Jessica will talk to you about in her talk later on in this session. So. For those of you who have been on farms a number of times, um, what I would say is you got time for about five emails. Check back in with me after that. Well, I'm going to show some examples of farms, what they look like, so you can just see. I think everybody, if, you, if I say apple orchard, it, in about a microsecond, you've got an image in your mind. Cornfield, even if you haven't lived in Iowa, you got a picture that's in your mind. What do you picture when I say tilapia farm? Well, you still got the corn farm. <laughs> 
So what I'll do is I'll go through a few examples. And the first example is a carnivorous farmed marine fish. And on your right here, you see 50,000 salmon eggs. And when these hatch then, they go into an indoor tank like these. This is at a site in, in Norway. And they spend about nine months, nine months to a year, in this indoor phase of their life. And recall, salmon are interesting in that they have a freshwater phase to their life and a marine phase to their life. So at about a year, they are developmentally poised to be able to go through all the metabolic changes that are required to allow them to move from these freshwater facilities and out into the salt water and the ocean. And when they do, these are um, the sorts of farms that people have for growing out uh, salmon in, in the ocean. On the left, you see a farm in Norway. On the upper right is a farm from Chile. And in the lower right, that's a salmon farm from uh, British Columbia. Oh, I, I, this was really a fun picture to take. So I was on a farm in Chile. And the fish in this pen were about three and a half kilos. So you know, these are real honest to goodness, fish. And the feed pellets that they were getting were about a centimeter and a half in diameter. And for anybody who's watched old westerns or reruns of Wild Wild West, they have these things called Gatling guns. Remember that? And so that's exactly how these fish are fed. This is a pneumatic tube that spits these things out. Um, and I don't know how fast it spits them out. But the seagulls would swoop in and try to pick them out of the air. Well, this seagull made a mistake just a second after I took this photograph, and he got wonked in the head. <laughs> and he kind of flopped down on top of the net, and 30 seconds later he stood up and flew off, and then decided he again was going to try to get one of these pellets. <laughs> but one of the very most important things in aquaculture um, is the feed. It represents roughly 70% of the cost of producing a fish. And there's a variety of different ingredients for aquaculture that are a bit different from the ingredients that are used in terrestrial animal agriculture. And Kareem Kumarli will tell you about that in his talk today later on in the session. Okay, this remember seafood. Remember, okay, this is the seafood nutrition partnership. This is the Nichols family day after Christmas breakfast. Um, eight years ago, when the Tartine bread book came out, I made I spent the best twenty six bucks I've ever spent in my life. I got it for my daughter, and she is fabulous at making sourdough bread. And so what this is is I smoked the salmon. She makes the bread. Um, and then one of the boys gets the short stick, and they got to do the eggs. But this is a tradition for us now on the 26th of December. So now, we'll switch gears to an omnivorous freshwater fish, and the example that I'll use for this is tilapia. Tilapia are grown in many places in the world for commercial purposes. Generally, the, what we receive in the United States comes either from Latin America or Southeast Asia. There's a lot of tilapia also grown in Africa, but that's mostly for domestic uh, consumption. And one system for growing tilapia, this is a Regal Springs farm in Indonesia, is the same kind of pen you saw for the, um, for the salmon a few slides ago. They're also grown in something called a raceway. So on the upper left of this, you see that hedgerow. Beyond that hedgerow is a river. And this is a sluice that's diverted from the river. The water comes through here. The fish are raised. This is, this is a tilapia farm. The fish are raised in this water. And then at the end of this is a water treatment plant that takes the water back into the river. And, um, it's not only tilapia that are grown this way. There are also shrimp grown this way in certain places in the world. Uh, a lot of catfish are grown this way. But it's just it's another culture system. White-legged shrimp, uh, as imports into the United States, come again from Latin America and Southeast Asia. And there are generally two different kinds of systems that are used for growing these. On the left, well, these are both in Thailand. And what, on the left, what you see is a fish farm that's, uh, excuse me, a shrimp farm that's in a mangrove. And this is a well-kept area, and the mangrove integrity has been preserved. On the right, you see 
farming in a mangrove, where the mangrove has just been obliterated in the service of expanding this farm. And so there's an interesting question. I want to buy my shrimp from the farm on the left. I don't want to buy my shrimp from the farm on the right. But when they're in the little frozen bag, I am hard-pressed to tell the difference. And so uh, there are some organizations that actually go out and examine the farming practices at farms around the world, uh, amongst them the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, Seafood Watch, and then uh, the Global Aquaculture Alliance. And Devin Meserve from the uh, GAA will talk to you about systems for understanding where and how your food is farmed and comes to you in her, uh, her talk in a moment. So in Latin America, shrimp are raised in these kind of ponds. Those little fuzzy things you see there are propellers that are turning to oxygenate the water. And so roughly half the shrimp that comes to us in the United States comes from Latin America. So as well as things that you feed, there's stuff that you don't feed. And, and um, amongst them, notably, are oysters. And um, in the United States, we um, predominantly have um, oysters, Pacific oysters. Okay. I want to show my mastery of the obvious here. From the Pacific. And um, Atlantic oysters that come from the Atlantic. An interesting thing about oysters is after fertilization, they're in a motile phase for two or three days. So they kind of swim around until they find something to latch on, and then they have the sessile phase, which is the bulk of their life cycle. And in a farm, you see they move from uh, through cages, wire meshes of uh, increasing porosity until you get to the point where they go out onto a farm where they grow to maturity in a year-ish, and that's what you see on your left. The two slides on your right are interesting. This is uh, from a farm called Ladies Island Oysters, about uh, an hour away from Charleston, South Carolina. And in the middle, what you see is people, ha they have these um, one meter long bamboo sticks. And when the oysters are spawning, they just, they go wag them in the water like that, and they wonk them into the mud. A year later, they come back, and they harvest these sticks, and there's, um, oh, it's flashing. Stop, Scott. Oh, my. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll hold this with two hands. You can't take it away. And you can harvest them uh, at, at about 2,000 or 200 at a time. So this sort of restates um, some of the thoughts about is it good for us? Is it not good for us? And why? So these are things that you've heard before. So I, I want to point on only one study that was about from a little over a decade ago that uh, from Harvard School of Public Health that said if we all were to eat two servings, and serving wasn't defined, of oily fish per week, it would lower the overall death rate from heart disease in the United States by 36% and the overall death rate by 17%. This is a stunning number. This is bigger than smoking. This is bigger than seatbelts. Okay, so um, it's it's something that we all really need to think about when we think about how and what we eat. On the left, um, I, I, I'm lucky that I work 15 meters from my kitchen, and that's a piece of Australis Monday. I always have um, a. Uh, orange and lemon confit in the fridge, and so it's really easy for me in a, a half a minute to put lunch together. I want to show my mastery of the obvious again. There's a line. And it would look like a flat line, but no, you'd be wrong. It has a slope of 0 0.0005. And this is not just any line. This is our line. This is the line, the regression line, that goes through seafood consumption in the United States. And we eat an iota more of fish now than we did in 1985. And what you're going to hear later on in the very last session of the day is you'll hear from uh, Jacqueline Claudia. JC is a person who is involved. She owns a company that's presenting fish to the public. And you'll also hear from Barton Seaver, someone who's presenting fish to a different audience. Barton's a chef. And they're going to tell us how they're changing this. So here's where we stand. We eat 14.9 pounds of fish per year. And we eat 48 pounds of french fries per year. Uh, there are a lot of adjectives one could use before broken. I'm not going to use any of them. But what we really need to do is we need to flip that. 
And if we were to do that, if we find a way to do that, our public health is going to be better, the environmental status of the production of our fish is going to be better, and uh, come on guys, look at the left, look at the right, what do you want to eat? So this, the fish on the left were prepared by my boys one night when they came over. Um, and so my job when my boys come over is to make sure that their ingredients and the expensive thing is I have to have God's quantity of beer. I never have seen so many beers disappear when these boys make a meal. But I have to have beer in the fridge, and that's my other contribution. So we uh, will we'll have time for questions at the end of this. Um, and, and please, do better than you did for these other guys, okay? We, we need some questions in a conversation. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming today.